All right, so my sermon for this evening is actually, it's, it's a very simple concept, but something that I feel like we need to hit from time to time, and especially if there's, you know, people are always going to be at different stages of spirituality, different understandings, and for my sermon this evening, it's going gonna, it's gonna to emphasize or highlight that we need to read the Bible carefully and pay attention to every word as it's written. And um, it's going to expose some false doctrine that people will teach because we're not, you know, they're not being careful with the words, or maybe they might not even be using a King James Bible. But um, it's something I want to point out. Many of you are probably already aware of this truth. It's a very simple one. It has to do with salvation. Um, so it's not like it's going to be groundbreaking or anything in, in this regard. But try to think about how you can apply this, and just as a reminder at the very least, onto how we ought to be reading, studying, and learning from God's Word. And the title of my sermon is, What Shall We Do? What Shall We Do? And there's a few times in Scripture where people will say, use that phrase, of, hey, well, what shall we do? And we find that in Acts chapter 2 here, which is actually a very uh, common place. There's, there's people who teach a false gospel out of Acts chapter 2 and they teach many things that are just wrong and normally it's the Pentecostal church that that preaches this way but there's many others that will do the same thing they're the most popular the most common that will turn to Acts 238 well I you know what do you believe you have to do to be saved I've had some people just say Acts 238 when we go out soul winning and we ask people what you know what do you got to do and they'll, they'll just give you the reference because that's what's emphasized so much. There's people who believe that you have to be baptized, literally physically baptized in order to be saved. And that if you're not, if you're not a believer and baptized, then you're not saved. Some people will teach that and some people believe that. But it's very clear what the scripture is saying. And if we read it carefully and we just understand what the words mean, you know, you can see that it doesn't teach that at all. And let's go ahead and look at Acts 2. Look at, look at verse number 36 there. There's a Bible, there's a, the, the passage starts here in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the preaching is coming against the Jews. And Peter's saying, look, God raised up Jesus Christ. You crucified him. You killed him. God raised him from the dead, and he's made him both Lord and Christ. Verse 37 says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. So they hear the preaching, and it actually bothers them. Going, oh, oh man, you're right. Now these are people who are open and receptive to hearing the truth. Because in this congregation, this group, there are some people who are open and some people who are not, right? Which is, which is very common anyways. You have some people who are just going to be fighting against it and rejecting. But some people, they hear that and they go, ooh, man, that stings. That went right to my heart. Yeah, you know what? I rejected Christ. I was part of that. But these people, it pricks their heart, says, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? So basically, you're saying, like, you're right, but, but what, you know, what should we do? What shall we do? And they answer in verse 38, said, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, is, who thinks that's good advice? <laughs> Amen. What should we, yeah, that's exactly what you should do. That's what you should do. You should repent, you should be baptized, and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, that's what Peter answered them, and it makes a lot of sense that he did. Do you think that's all they should do? No. There's, there's a lot more things that we should do, right? I mean, as Christians, aren't there a lot of things that we should do? Of course there are. But the reason why I'm going so in-depth on this is you know, what does the Bible say? They said, what shall we do? And, that's, and they got an answer that was appropriate to the question. But what people will take this verse 
and say, well, see, look, in order to be saved, you need to repent, you need to be baptized, you know, it's all this stuff. And I'm not going to get into repentance this evening, but the word repent literally means to rethink. You change your mind, right? It, it's not inherently talking about sin at all. It may or may not be talking about sin depending on the context, but that's another issue that people get hung up on. Like I said, it goes beyond the scope of what I'm trying to teach today, so I'm not going to get really involved in that. But he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. This verse, again, when it says for the remission of sins, it means because of the remission of sins. Why do we get baptized? We get baptized because we're symbolizing what we already believe in our heart. We're outwardly showing the symbolic meaning behind our faith. That makes sense. And, and we just had three baptisms today. And with, with everybody, I was trying to explain, hey, here's what baptism pictures. When you're standing in the water, it's, it's a picture of Jesus Christ being on the cross. When you get dunked under the water, we go, you go backwards, you get dunked underwater. It's a picture of his burial, going in the grave, being buried, and then coming back up. We don't drown you, right? We, we bring you right back up out of the water, symbolizing the resurrection of Christ. So that outwardly is, is something that's physically done that's showing everybody this is what's in my heart. This is what I believe. Because no one can see your heart. So this is a really good way of showing this is where my faith is. And I'm going to take that step and show everybody, hey, my faith is in Christ. Baptize me. Get me, you know. I'm doing that because I've been saved for the remission of sin. So a, a real simple way to understand this, I think this is a great illustration. I heard this a long time ago, and it stuck with me because it makes a lot of sense. Everybody is probably, or most people are familiar with the old Western signs that say, like, wanted for murder, wanted for burglary, wanted for whatever. There's a picture of a guy's face wearing the cowboy hat, right? And it's old wanted on the top. And they still have wanted. I mean, they wanted on FBI websites. They have the, you know, the top 10 most wanted, America's most wanted, right? And they'll say wanted for whatever. And that word for means because that's what they did. And you cannot confuse, you have to be able to understand English if you're reading in English and understand the language a little bit, I mean, enough to just know what it's saying here, but you got to read it carefully to understand what the meaning is. It's easy to get things twisted if you're not understanding language or if you're not reading it very carefully. And they'll take this verse and say, see, you need to be baptized in order to receive the remission of sins, which is not what it says. It uses the word for. And that word for can be used different ways, but in the context here, it's the same way as someone is wanted for murder. It's not like you put up a sign and say, I want somebody to commit a murder. Like it's an ad, like you're hiring. It's because of what they've done. So we get baptized because of what we've done. But you know what? This is all things that we should do. These are all good things that people should do. But notice... There's a big difference between what shall we do and what must I do to be saved. So you want to know what shall I do? Oh, there's a lot of things that you should do. So why would we turn to a passage where they just say, basically, what's good for me to do? What should we do? To figure out the exact requirements for salvation when you already have a, a verse in the same book just a little bit later in the passage that tells that literally asks the very question, what must I do to be saved? I mean, how much more clear is that question as opposed to just, well, hey, what should we do? I mean, someone just comes up to you and says, well, hey, what should I do? I mean, you're going to tell them who knows what. Your answer might be different than the next person's answer. What should we do? Oh, here's what you should do. I mean... But if someone came up to you and said, hey, what must I do to be saved? Wow, that's very specific. That's very clear. We know what that, what that question is talking about. And if you're going to go to a verse, this is why I love using this, and pretty much every time I give the gospel to somebody, because it's so clear. 
I even tell people at the door, I was like, look, this is the question, because you ask the question first, you know, if you're for sure, if you die today, you're going to heaven, and then you ask them why, if they do or don't, whatever. And then by the time I get back to, you know, after I show them their sinner and all the punishment and everything else, I get back to see, you know, when I first came here and I asked you this question, this is basically what I was asking you is what do you think you have to do to be saved? Right, this is what I, this is what I was asking you. And you know what's great about the Bible? The Bible actually has that question in it already. Look at this. Check it out. Because before you didn't, you didn't know what we needed to do or you thought we had to be a good person. Look, the Bible gives us the answer. And the question's right here. What must I do to be saved? In Acts 16. And of course it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in the house. Not only do they answer a direct question, but even the answer is extremely clear and spells out, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It leaves no wiggle room for saying, oh yeah, but they also meant that you had to be baptized too because see, he gets baptized later. I've had people try to say that. But what's important is what they said. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He said, if you believe, you will be saved. Like, that's what it takes to be saved. Yeah, they got baptized later because everybody who believes should get baptized. But when they asked a specific question, they gave a specific answer, and baptism was not part of it. And even in Acts 2, you know, when people like to bring that up, if you read in context, if you just go up a few verses earlier to verse 21, the Bible says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could, you could answer, what must I do to be saved in Acts chapter 2 by going to verse 21. Go, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Right, and then you can just flip over to Romans 10 to give you the, the, full, the more full explanation of what it means to call on the name of the Lord. And guess what? It all lines up perfectly with Acts 16. It all lines up perfectly with John 3.16. It all lines up perfectly with the entire rest of the Bible. So when we read scripture, we do want to be careful. Now look, I said before, for us, this may seem like an obvious one for, you know, it may seem very obvious for you. You've already heard this. You already know this. You've already heard other people try to say this. But it ought to be a reminder, what about things that you're not quite as familiar with? You need to be reading your Bible very carefully so that you don't assume the Bible means something. You have to look and see, well, what does it actually say? And be careful about it so you're not making mistakes in your doctrine based on a loose reading or, or just not even being careful when you read every word of the Bible. Flip over, if you would, to Luke chapter 3. So I want to continue down this, what shall we do, right? What shall we do? There's a lot of things you should do. Repent and be baptized, those are great things to do. And, I, and I, I'm, full, I'm all for it. People repenting, whether that means turning from sin or whether that just means putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they, you should do both of them. You should. You should believe on Jesus if you don't already. You should give up your sins. You should, you should try to live a, a, a perfectly sold out life for God. You should get, which is going to include being baptized. You should go to church. You should read your Bible. You should pray. You should do all of those things. What shall we do? We should do those things. Luke chapter 3 gives us another example of people asking a question, what shall we do? Look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, Then said he to the multitude, this is John the Baptist speaking, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? So this is kind of similar to what was going on in Acts chapter 2. Because you've got these people getting pricked in the heart and saying, well, what should we do? And they get a good answer. Now, these people are coming to him, and, and it says here, you know, he's speaking to uh, just a group at whole, and he sees that some of the Pharisees had come, and he's, he's basically, you know, questioning 
their sincerity of even being there. Like, you generation of vipers, what are you doing here? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And he knows what they already believe, because it's, it's well known that these Pharisees are just trusting in the fact that they're a seed of Abraham, that they're the special chosen people, and that they're the people of God, and whatever, and they're trusting in that instead of trusting in Jesus. And that's why he said, hey, God's able of these stones to raise up seed on Abraham. That doesn't mean nothing. And he gives a warning about the axe being laid to the root of the trees. He's saying, look, God's going God's to cast these uh, trees that don't bring forth good fruit into the fire. So when people ask him, saying, well, what should we do then? Verse 11 says, he answereth and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. We have another example here of things. Now, are these all good things for these people to do? Yes. Yes. But are these all answers for being saved? Is it a different answer for a publican and a soldier? Well, what should I do? Well, to be saved, does he say that to be saved? Are they asking him, what must I do to be saved? No. No. They're saying, what should I do? And look, it's a good question. What should I do? I have people ask me sometimes, what should I do? And you want to help them. So, like John the Baptist did, Okay, what's your situation? Oh, you're, you're a publican, right? The publicans that came to him and said, hey, what should we do? Hey, don't exact more than that which is appointed you. Apparently, the job of being this tax collector, being this publican, it was easy for them to then say, oh, no, like, you, you owe 50 bucks. No, no, you owe 60 bucks, right? And they take a little cut for themselves. And apparently, when you read the Bible, this is something that was kind of common. I think that's why a lot of people hated the tax man too because they're getting their own little little grift going on there, their own little side action of, of this money under the authority of government, under the color of law, going in and, and getting this extra money. And people hated them. Because it was common for people that position. It, it's, like, it's like corrupt cops, right, that just want to get a little payoff. They pull you over. Oh, you want to get it? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you could settle this right now for 50 bucks. And it's not, might, may not be very common here in the United States, but it is in many, many other countries. Very common occurrence. It's just how you deal with things. And, and it's the way that it, was, that it was here with the publican. So he's telling them, hey, these people are coming to get baptized, which if they're coming to get baptized, we're going to assume that they already got saved. So now, hey, if I'm saved and I'm in this position and I'm getting baptized, it's, it, it makes sense to ask, well, what, now what should I do? I'm saved, now what? I'm baptized, now what should I do? And he's giving them advice, saying, well, here's what you should do. Don't exact any more than you're supposed to. Don't steal from people. That's a good start. Or the soldiers. Hey, don't do violence to any man. Now, that word violence, it doesn't mean you can't be a soldier and do what soldiers do in regards of, like, if you're going to war and combat, violence means you're violating somebody because, you know, I mean, think about this. Soldiers go to war, but you know what a lot of soldiers do when they go to war? They rape and pillage and steal and do things that they're not supposed to be doing when they're supposed to just be engaged in combat and fighting an enemy and, and, or protecting and defending or whatever. They do a lot of things where they violate people just because they can get away with it, because they're in that position, because they have that power, just like the tax man has his own power, and he's able to do some things and get away with it, but it's not right. And he's just telling these people, informing these people, this is what you should do. Hey, be content with your wages. Be content. And, and that could go for anyone. Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. That's good advice for everybody. Everything he's saying here is good advice for everybody, but these are all things that we should do. You, get, you cannot confuse this or confound it or, or 
conflate it with salvation. It's not what it's talking about. Turn to Luke chapter 19. Here in Luke 3, just flip over to Luke chapter 19, we're going to see the story of Zacchaeus. And, and, you know, I'm turning to these passages because all of these passages are passages that people can get confused on if you already don't have the proper understanding of salvation. People can read these things and they think like, oh man, it's in Acts chapter 2, it's in Luke 3, it's in Luke 19. You know, all over the Bible there's all these examples and then they'll pull up these other, and I don't have them in my notes, but there's, you know, the references of Jesus with the, with the rich young, young ruler comes up to him and says, you know, what, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, you know the commandments. What, what, is the, what does the law say? Right? And he's like, I kept all these things from my youth up. You know, I'm doing this. I'm perfect. And then Jesus tells him, you know, go and sell everything that thou hast and follow me, right? And you'll have riches in heaven. So the answer that he gives him isn't to say that that's what you need to do to be saved and go to heaven. He was obviously driving home another point. Now, it doesn't mean his answer was untrue, but he knew he was incapable of it. That guy couldn't pick up his cross and be crucified for the world. But he's basically saying, if you're perfect, and that's a big important if, because he did say, if thou wilt be perfect then, since he already testified that he kept all the commandments from his youth up. Jesus knew better, but if that were the case, then this is what you have to do, right? Because you have to do righteousness. Not only not sin, you have to do righteousness. So he's telling him a truthful answer based on that premise, but the premise was already false, and Jesus knew that, and he was still trying to drive on a point. But You have to take the Bible in its context as well as it needs to match up with all the rest of the teachings too, right? So people who like to twist scripture are always going to places to, and not in one, usually just not even reading them properly. 99 times out of 100, you get someone trying to teach you some false doctrine out of scripture, all you have to do is read a little bit before and a little bit after whatever verse they're trying to show you. It's all you got to do. It's actually very easy. The last, I, I haven't preached on this in a while, but the, I, I preach against like Lordship Salvation, against John MacArthur and all those guys that, that teach that, that wicked doctrine of devils. And they like to write these articles and write all these references, right? They, they, they make one claim, they make one point, and then they say, you know, Ephesians 2, 19, and, this, and, this, and Matthew, and Mark, and, and, you know, and they just make all these Bible references to make it look like, wow. Well, I mean, if the Bible says that in so many places, even if they're incorrect about one or two of them, I mean, if it's just saying that all over the place, then this must be true. They want people to be lazy and just think that, just accept it. Wow, the Bible says it all those places. No, you have to look it up. Don't just, don't just accept what it says. Because every time you look it up, whatever claim they're making, you read that verse, and then you read the context, and you're going like, that's not what that's talking about at all. That doesn't support your claim. And guess what? When you look up people like John MacArthur and, and these claims, none of them match what they're saying. And I don't care how many they use. It could be 15 or 20, and they got it all wrong because they're blind. But I digress. Let's look at Luke chapter 19 because here's one that, you know, this may not be a passage you're going to use when you go out soul winning with someone because you like using the clear passages. And this can also seem a little bit unclear, but when you read it carefully, again, you're going to see it's the same concept of, well, there's a difference between what should I do and what must I do to be saved? Two different things. Read carefully. Look at Luke 19, verse number 2. The Bible says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. All right, he's a guy that people don't like. He's a publican, and you better believe he was exacting more money than he should have. He was getting rich off of people by doing this. Okay, so not a very well-liked guy, not a good guy. We're going to see what happens here. Verse 3, he says, And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, 
and could not for the press because he was little of stature. Little of stature means he was short. He was a short guy. He probably had a short man complex and like stealing from people because he felt like he was in a position of power and abusing that. But um, this is who Zacchaeus was. So because he couldn't see, because he's short, verse 4 says, and he ran there before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was a pass that way. So he really wants to see Jesus. He's excited about Jesus being there, wants to get a glimpse of him. He's too short to see. There's too many people around, so he climbs up into a tree just to witness Jesus coming by. Verse 5 says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. So the Bible says in verse 6 that, that, Jesus, that Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. Now, obviously, on the, con on the service, it's, it's referring to him receiving him to his house. But I think Zacchaeus gets saved and actually receives Jesus as his Savior. It doesn't say that here. Okay, so this is my opinion on the matter. But Look what it says in verse 7. Let's keep reading here. And this Bible says, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now, this, this answer, again, you cannot turn to this and be like, well, see, this is what you have to do to be saved. Because it's just simply not there. You have, to, you have to give fourfold. You have to, you're like, no, the Bible doesn't say you have to do those things to be saved. But these are all good things to do. And Jesus' answer, even too, just saying that this day is salvation, come to this house. Jesus is the salvation. And he came to his house, and he was sent to the lost tribes of the children of Israel, and he didn't go into the Gentiles. He came unto his own. So for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, he's saying, well, I got to reach this guy too. Because he's a Hebrew. So I'm going to, to reach these people. And salvation has come to this house now too because he's come to his house. Right? I mean, that's what he's saying. And, and that's pretty simple. But it, it's, it's not, people will take this and say, well, see, this is how you know he got saved is because now he's giving his money and if people don't have this type of fruit or this type of behavior, and, and they like to just throw doubt on people's salvation because they turn to stories like this. And this is what, that's why I hate about that. And this is why you have to read the Bible carefully. Don't add more to it than that's there. And, and don't teach it like, well, if you don't have this, then you're definitely not saved. But here's the thing. Is it a good thing for Zacchaeus to restore fourfold to people he stole from? Of course it is. And when it comes to what shall we do, and if you're going to ask me, hey, pass the person, I'm saved, now what should I do? You should try to get everything right in your life that you could get right. That's what you should do. Now you should take this time and move forward and say, hey, what have I done wrong? Let me try to do my best to make amends and to, do, to try to make things right. And yeah, you can't undo the past, but what you can do is start moving forward doing right. And that's what you should do. And it doesn't prove that you were saved when you do those things. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation other than it's the right thing to do. Because after you get saved, you should do good. You should do right. Obeying God's law doesn't make you saved. Turn to, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Famous passage. We all know. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We use it out soul winning all the time. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, as any mention boast. We explain that to people. right? That's clear salvation verses. It's a gift. It's grace. It has nothing to do with you. It's something that you just receive for free, right? But I've heard people, like the Lordship Salvation crowd, they like to use verse 10 to prove, well, see, you need to have works. But they don't really go to verses 8 and 9. They just like going to Ephesians 2.10, which is why I'm bringing it up now, because we know what verses 8 and 9 are in context, and then you get to verse 10, Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 
And they like to use that somehow to say, see, you have to have the works. Because you were created unto works, so if you weren't created unto works, you, didn't, you weren't ever saved, you don't have the good works or whatever. It's like, look, no. No. First of all, salvation is free. It's nothing to do with you. That's evident. That's clear. It's a gift. It's grace. Verses 8 and 9 explain that perfectly. But after you're saved, now that you know that, now that you're saved, you have to understand we are his workmanship. And as a new creature, God did create you to do good works. That's what he wants you to do. Because your salvation is just the beginning. It's not the end. It's not like, great, I'm saved, now I can die. No. You're just getting started now. You're a baby. <laughs> now now you've got to grow. Now you've got to learn. Now you've got work for God to do for the Lord. And like the rest of that verse says, which God ordained, that we should, we should walk in them. You should. It doesn't say that you must walk in them or else you're not saved. It doesn't say that um, you know, anything other of the sort other than that's what you should do. So what should we do? Turn to... Turn to Mark chapter 12. And we looked at this recently as well. And it's very similar, tied closely with Matthew chapter 7. I read Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So what, what should we be doing? We should be treating people the way that we want to be treated. Right? That's some good advice. That's applicable to everybody. What should I do? Hey, I'm saved. What should I do? How about you start treating people the way you want to be treated? That's some good advice. What should we do? Mark 12, verse 29. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Hey, I'm saved. What should I do? Start loving God. Start loving people. Start living your life and, and making actions that's going to show that you actually love them. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And, and, you know, this is where I'm going to just, just drive it home. We're almost done with the sermon. Is that your shorter sermon this evening? But what should you do? Well, are you saved? Shouldn't we love the Lord that saved us? I mean, think, think about it. And, and people, if you've been saved for a long time, think about it even harder. Because it's, it, people who just get saved, people who have been saved more recently, it's more fresh in their minds. If you've been saved for a long time, I've been saved for a long time. I've been saved for 24 years. It's been a long time now since I got saved. And memory fades over time. I've actually been saved longer than I've been unsaved in my entire life. So there's been more years that I've been saved a child of God than, than not. Don't forget what Jesus did for you. And this is, this is also why it's so important to be preaching the gospel regularly. Because it also helps you to remember that. You preach the gospel. And, and I was just recently, you know, just out soul winning yesterday, I was, I was, you know, you explain to people, do you know how much God loves you? Explaining what did he do for you? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, King of kings and Lord of lords, Humbling himself, coming to this earth, being mocked and ridiculed and spit on and, and crucified, nailed to a cross, allowing people to humiliate him publicly and being tortured up on that cross and, and, and committing his soul to, to that death, dying and having his soul go to hell 
bearing your sins, your sins, what you've done that you deserve to go to hell to pay for, he did that for you. What should we do? How about we love Jesus? Not with your mouth. Or I should say not just with your mouth. Shouldn't we have enough respect and appreciation for what he's done for us to at least try to listen to him? Are you so important and so busy in your life that you have no time to read the Word? The Word saved you. Now you're done with that? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. Do you love Jesus? It's easy to say that. It's easy to say. It's another thing to do. Last place I have you turn, turn if you would to 1 John chapter 5. We ought to, as the Bible says, offer our bodies a living sacrifice. If Jesus sacrificed everything for us, if the Father sacrificed everything for us, or the, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, shouldn't we Is there anything that you shouldn't be willing to do for God when he did everything for you? Everything for you. Take the time to realize fully in your minds Reflect on the things that you've done that you know were sinful against God and against man. Understanding the full punishment of being in a dark, hot hell where all you hear is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and people screaming and writhing in pain. You've been removed from that because Jesus paid that for you. There's nothing bigger than that. The things, the cares of this world distract us from the gravity of that reality. If you're saved, that is a reality for you. We hear the word hell a lot, but we don't spend much time really thinking about it and understanding <laughs> the wicked creatures that we are from our own sin, that, that we deserve that type of a punishment. But because God loves us even more than that, he's paid our way in full. What does that mean to you and how do you show that to God? What should we do? You know what God wants you to do? He wants you to listen to him and obey him. He's not even asking or demanding much of us. Ultimately, it's not a lot. We should be giving everything, giving our all, to him it's worth it he's worth it first john 5 2 says by this we know that we love the children of god when we love god and keep his commandments for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous even if his commandments were grievous we should still keep them we owe it to them but they're not grievous they're good for you 
keeping his commandments is actually <laughs> a benefit for you. It's interesting how the world mixes the works with the salvation because, see, for us, for, for when you get saved, you know, you understand that the works, the good deeds, have nothing to do with your salvation at all. It's completely 100% free gift. But the vast majority of the world, to people who don't believe, they think that the works are a part of that. But what's funny is that then those same people, they don't have anywhere close to the amount of works that the people who have received a free gift are trying to, to do and keep. It's like, you think you're saved by your works. I don't. And I'm doing way more works than you're doing. Why? Because everybody understands that works are important. Keeping the law is important. God gave commandments, not suggestions. Commandments. We all understand. Saved and unsaved alike can understand that. Commandments are important. Absolutely very important. The key is they are not part of your salvation, but it's what shall I do? It's what shall I do after salvation? Now walk in the commandments of the Lord. Do what's right. Have that righteousness. God's worthy of it. Are you doing enough? Probably not. Am I doing enough? Probably not. Definitely not. The price was really high that, that was paid for you. But don't be flippant about it. Don't, don't treat salvation, church, the Bible, singing praises like it's, eh, like it's nothing to you. Definitely don't have that attitude and then say, oh yeah, but I love God. We need to show some respect for our Savior. What shall we do? All the advice that we saw in all the verses that we looked at is all great advice you should do. But it's summarized, love God, love people by obeying the commandments and treating people the way you'd like to be treated. It's just pretty simple. Overall, it's pretty simple. You, you break it down into a simple concept. But make it important for you. Important enough to change. Change. Repent in that regard. How about that? Let's change so that God could be more pleased with us. I don't want to make God ashamed. Not after what he did for me. As far as I've ordered prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for saving us. God, I pray that you would please um, help us to continue to learn and grow and understand more. Lord, help us not forget the... Um, the hell that we were saved from. Help us not forget the, um, the act of love that you showed for us. And Lord, that's through soul winning, it helps keep that fresh. And uh, we're, I'm thank you for giving us the, that job. But you know all these things. You, you know that we need to, to go, over th go over these, uh, go over the gospel over and over again with people so that we could remind ourselves about it. And we thank you for that. Thank you for giving us that job. Lord, help us to do what's right. Help us to know what's right. God bless us. We're here. We love you. Uh, this whole group, congregation of people here, we're, we're trying to serve you, Lord. And um, we pray that you please just lighten up our path, keep us safe from evil, and help us to do the work that you've laid out before us. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.